Welcome back to the show. Thank you for joining us. We have one of our favorite guests here, Dakota Von Adams, the estranged son of Stuart Rhodes, um, the founder of the Oath Keepers. Uh, Dakota, thank you for joining us again for some of the updates that are in the news. Oh, thank you for having me on. And in my bit of shameless self-promotion and family promotion, I yeah. am Dakota V. Adams on Twitter. And my mother is Tasha Adams, who you should also follow for the latest, closest possible inside view of the mind of Stuart Rhodes as we go into the coming year of Oath Keepers and Stuart being completely fucked. Why? Well, I'm glad to have you, and I'm glad you plugged that. Is there a website that the folks can go to uh, before we start asking questions? Uh, that, that way they know where to go, not just to Twitter, but to a website. Thatgirltasha.com at her personal blog is where you can go for updates on my mom's book in progress and her perspective on the Oath Keepers related happenings that we're going to see more and more of as the year progresses and all of the secret Santa's workshop hours that the Department of Justice and the January 6th committee have been putting in start to show up at our chimneys. Like that's, the prettiest, best wrapped gifts you've ever gotten. Right. That's a I'm perfect excited. Christmas gift. Yeah, I'm excited yeah. for that Santa Claus to show up. So let's get to the questions. Let me ask the first question here. It seems like his paranoia from the Bundy Ranch has like, it's like, you know, that paranoia where he was able to do a 180 flip on his original mission of the Oath Keepers has totally done a 180 on like his whole reason of to avoid prosecution for whatever happened at the money ranch. Yeah. So it's very interesting to, excuse me, sorry. It's very interesting to think about it in terms of like how Bundy ranch kind of signaled the point where Stewart's self-interest doomed the ideology behind oath keepers because he went missing in action for a long time where people at Bundy Ranch had no idea where the hell he was and mm -hmm. a bunch of money was unaccounted for and I and there's no there's no telling what happened to it the uh, oath keepers money situation was intentionally too complicated for any one person to keep a handle on so most you mean, likely you mean, you mean by design Stuart did by that design. or okay mm -hmm. by design Stuart did that that's why you have uh 50 separate active bank accounts that are supposedly going to be tied to state chapters and then never used is to create an intentionally complicated money situation is that why he opened state chapters you think is to create this this layering well, of of organizations so it was kind of like buffering away from him or something Oh, that's how the infrastructure was used later. But uh, the state chapters happened because people were independently organizing their own state chapters. And then like Oath Keepers National was finding out about them through events. Oh, so 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 they were doing it without like Stewart's and the Oath Keepers, the National Oath Keepers permission. And then is that how he kind of brought him underneath? Yeah, and then they wing? started bringing them all into an official structure. And then the state chapters uh, became where he would recruit leadership for the board of directors and national positions like uh, vice president, chaplain, editor, uh, people in charge of different projects, all of those. And then they would have to deal with Stuart, have to deal with a project that required Stuart to do any work become incredibly burnt out and then leave. And then eventually the state chapter people started getting burnt out independently because uh, dues sharing, like the membership dues money that was supposed to be shared part way with the state chapters for state mm -hmm. level organizing and events and expenses never happened. And the uh, lack of communication with Oath Keepers National and lack of backup or right. lack of support for any state level things unless Stuart could grandstand there and happen to be in position to do so. Uh, that started to wear on everyone, or I believe there are still a lot of Oath Keepers groups that split off from Oath Keepers National that are continuing and going strong as independent regional and, and like state level or local organizations that are no longer affiliated with Oath Keepers, but started that way. But the genesis of all that going wrong was in Bundy Ranch, where uh, Stewart discovered a shortcut for making a ton of money, getting adulation, 
getting attention from people that had more impressive military credentials even than he did, even combat experience and higher education, which was uh, pulling Oath Keepers operations. Like the uh, narcissistic supply and money and being a cool guy, like in a leadership position that he showered himself with during Bundy Ranch became incredibly addictive. And it was the exact same psychology that you see in like the guys who showed up to the Malky were standoff to treat it like a getaway from their lives. It was so much more fun than the humdrum day to day of doing nothing while you avoid the work of running a national level veterans organization. So, so you think it's kind of like a cosplay thing? Is that what you're kind of saying? Basically, almost? yes. He get to he got to cosplay effectively as a general. This, fan, uh, this fantasy were main thing. Th this fantasy were like the the tunnels that we talked about before, and the getaway car, and some of these other. Oh, that was all his personal thing. paranoia. That was pre -ex that was pre existing. Oh, I see. I, I didn't know if it was all paranoid. part of this. I didn't yeah. know if it was, that was all part of this cosplay, this fantasy of that the world would end, and you know you would have this uh, where he would be the the leader of the you know whatever. That know. actually. You actually you are right now that you now that I've let you phrase it fully instead of interrupting you. It's uh, that fan the persecution element of his grandiose savior fantasy, right, is what led to the escape tunnels and the paranoia about felony stops. So you got so when you travel in a convoy and anybody doing any kind of oath keepers thing always had to travel in a convoy because it was a way for him to be in charge of a thing. You had right. to space out enough that the cops could only stop one or two vehicles at a time in a, at a felony stop checkpoint and all that shit. But it kind of, I can't remember the correct pronunciation when a tumor begins to grow out of control. Mm -hmm. Metastasize, however you Meta pronounce metast that. Metastasize, yeah. Metastasize, yes. That is where it began to get bad was Bundy Ranch. And he went through his deep, dark, depressive hole from people making fun of him for pulling Oath Keepers out to the perimeter and fleeing the ranch when the rumors started to circulate about a drone strike being authorized by the Department of Defense, which is completely fucking ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. As, it's like they on, you only get away with something like a move bombing once. You're not going to pull off an airstrike on a bunch of white dudes in the desert and get right. away with it in the national eye. Well, you know, we see this layering that you're talking about, like this this paranoia and this layering in in the January 6th story in recent articles. Um, we, we know there was an article by Politico, I believe, uh, last month, and it, it talked about text messages and a trove of text messages that are basically revealed um, from Stuart Rhodes and other Oath Keepers to Trump associates like Mike Flynn and Roger Stone and even even a congressman, uh, uh, Ronnie Jackson, I believe. And there was some more new reporting, too, um, also about, you know, some of the orders that were supposed to be handed down. What do you do you think that's all part, part of his? Uh, abandon him, abandonment of having him his own self not involved in some of this layering where he's kind of at the central point of it or I mean how do you feel about that what that looks like to me is what I thought a while ago is that Stewart would revel in the attention I think mm -hmm. of being in the inner circle and close to Trump he would want to position himself basically as far from personal harm as possible within his overriding fantasy of being a savior George Washington figure. <laughs> and starting from at the beginning of the Trump administration, the game plan was basically to take Oath Keepers in a Trump critical, like constitutional watchdog direction, where it was going to be the kind of an iteration on the same game plan for if uh, Romney had won instead of Obama in 2008, where it might be less energizing than a threatening Democrat winning, but this guy still needs to be watched because uh, any product of the political machine is inherently untrustworthy and mm -hmm. the president should have his shit called out all the time. Well, you know, that's interesting that you say that because in the pr previous uh, times that we've talked, you said that there was two different directions that 
uh, when Stewart really concocted the Oath Keepers, he had two different plans. One if Romney or excuse me, one if McCain won, one if uh, Obama won. And then you're saying the Romney election, there's there's another plan. And then during the Trump election, there seems to be another plan. So he's always he's always trying to plan and scheme based on what the national mood is. Exactly. He is doing exactly what he's always criticized politicians of doing, which is testing the wind to see what's to see which way the wind is blowing. Now, he's basically like a fair weather patriot. (laughs) Yeah. And good, good, good phrase. The uh, if the original plan had been stuck to then he would have kept to the same line of thought and then criticized the Trump administration whenever it did anything unconstitutional, which would have turned into a huge moment for Oath Keepers to step into the spotlight Mm -hmm. as a bipartisan check against totalitarianism like it was supposed to be in the original mission statement if they'd kept their eyes on the prize and not drifted right into crazy town by the time of uh, disguised federal task forces abducting people off the streets during the Black Lives Matter protests. And it could have mm-hmm. been like, wow, this is exactly right. what we've been warning about. Hey, conservatives, right. mm-hmm. the police, I mean, just like right now with the uh, all the proposed, uh, proposed checkpoints to require uh, negative pregnancy tests of women before they cross state yeah. lines under some of these new state laws, that is a backdoor into implementing the police state in a way where gun owning militia militia adjacent conservatives will go along with it until it's too late is how i would phrase it right and that is exactly what oath keepers could have done but stewart's self-interest in his fear of being arrested by a democrat administration over bundy ranch caused him to cling increasingly to the coattails of the trump administration the proud boys going to the berkeley protests brought in more money even if he got mad that gavin mcginnis and the proud boys kept getting top billing at events and he didn't and then like i think tasha has it right mom has it right where she thinks that he got hooked up with somebody when he was supposedly pulling security at the maga ball after trump's inauguration Mm -hmm. and then as he became more and more paranoid over what would happen to him if a democrat ever took office again there's this guy there's this guy who's telling him they can make everything okay if he can bring his people on board now in the past uh Stewart had been approached to be the paramilitary arm of weird shit and then (laughs) turned it down because being independent was more in his self-interest at the time. The last one was a person I believe to be Matt Shea, because I know he was associated with Matt Shea a bunch after that point and went and spoke at the uh, Marblehead community and everything that Matt Shea is heavily involved with. This is the uh, state representative who had the internal dossier in his office calling for uh, a biblical war against communism and a Christian takeover of the United States. Sounds like, also, a, sounds like a really interesting fellow, by the way. Yes, he's also <laughs> just recently been uh, in trouble for trying to get uh, Ukrainian children and uh, separated from their parents and orphans uh, shipped to the United States from refugee camps in Poland without any paperwork whatsoever and didn't want to give his name to Polish authorities. Uh, so Matt Shea is I probably to be adopted out into proper Christian household and raised as stormtroopers. Like he is in, yeah, yeah, yeah. in that side of it. But somebody in an evangelical Christian group that was somewhat underground approached Stuart uh, asking if Oath Keepers would serve as part of their paramilitary arm if a collapse came for creating an American Christian theocracy that would mm-hmm. take over in the absence of the government, and Stewart turned him down. But I think that was Matt Shea, and he kept contact with that Matt Shea after that point, even though it's basically the same thing Matt Shea believes in, even if it wasn't the same guy. So that tells me that he was keeping his options open in the background. So even if he started out being critical of Trump on the Constitution, he was going to keep that back channel open in case he needed a plan B. And then as he gets more and more afraid of what happens if Trump loses the election and there is a liberal president over the Department of Justice, what's going to happen to him. And that's where he starts to get sucked into 
Trump's circle. And I do not believe that he would have gone as far as to be the aggressor operating in a hostile space like D.C., where in the past he'd been incredibly critical of, I can't remember the dude's name. Uh, I want to say Fishbach, but that's completely wrong. That's something something people were talking him like in a uh, calling him in a derogatory fashion he was a right-wing libertarian dude who was leading going to lead a second amendment rights march on washington dc years in the past and we're trying to find that got so, shouted down so what 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 was what was stewart's mindset about washington dc exactly then like what would he i mean i mean what was his opinion on you know going into dc and you know um, uh, like you said, what what was his objection to it? Uh, that it was a terrible idea that would start a civil conflict between the right wing militia movement and the federal government in a position where the militia movement would almost certainly lose and look like the aggressor, <laughs> thereby immediately taking a defeat and losing a huge chunk of popular support in one fell swoop. He thought it was the dumbest thing he'd ever heard in his life to take guns into Washington, D.C. as some kind of political movement. Well, and you know, he thought that Malheur was the stupidest thing he'd ever heard of, too. And then he goes and does this. He goes right, and pl right. plots out the QRF and stashes weapons across the Potomac with guys apparently waiting to uh, take the QR, the armed QRF across with a boat if necessary, which leads me to believe that he had assurances that he would not face consequence for it. Right. Right. And assurances from someone who I don't know may may be able to do something. I don't know. Maybe the word pardon comes to mind. I don't know. Right. That might 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 but be that's it. the other thing I wonder too is like, you know, whether or not there was actually actually direct communication from Trump to say Roger Stone to Stewart. You know, I wonder well, if, if Roger was like, yeah, 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 yeah. Like I'll 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 do I'll figure it out. And then Stewart like on just the trust of his word was like, great. Okay, cool. We'll shut that shit up and we'll be ready to go whenever you need us. But there was actually no like security of a pardon. Well, I think there were, there are some people claims surfacing that Roger Stone was auctioning off pardons for tens of thousands of dollars a piece yeah. and then was unable to follow through with the, on the promise of the auction pardons. Yeah, yeah. There is the uh, witness testimony from, the man whose name I can't recall, even though I should, who just pled guilty, stating that Stewart called an intermediary who refused to put him on directly with Donald Trump. You're not talking about Joshua. Message. You're not talking about Joshua James, right? You're talking about the the newest Oath Keeper. That the newest. Yeah. yeah. The guy who says he was in a hotel room when Stewart tried to personally reach Trump over the phone mm -hmm. and got told no by the intermediary that he would not be handing him off to speak to Trump personally for this phone conversation. And basically left also... a message begging to be called up to fight at, at 6 p.m. that day when it when January 6 was winding down. It was clear that they had not won. There was the connection between and this is a side thing. Joel Greenberg, Joel Greenberg, Matt Gates, and Roger Stone around pardons as well. Right. Um, but that right. obviously right. never, never, you know, bubbled up to something on the surface. It was just like there. I don't know if it was from Joel Greenberg's camp or someone else, but the idea of auction off pardons was something that was at least floated within that camp so yes to, to your point of what you're saying like yeah obviously that is totally on brand and then there's but there is that element where i'm like is roger stone just pocketing the money for whoever the highest bidder is without any sort of reassurances from trump or even if he was like oh i'm i even spoke to trump he was like i'll take your money and then i'm just gonna Hit the road, you know. I, I don't know if you're I asking Dakota that likely. question. Yeah, I'm not. I was gonna say I don't know if you're asking Dakota that question, but I'll answer the question. Hell to the yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's 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 on brand for Roger Stone. Now we don't. Well, I guess we'll find out maybe eventually in federal court. I think I think the uh, the person that you're speaking of who has pled uh, guilty uh, in in the uh, conspiracy here is Brian Ulrich. Uh, yes, that is the third guilty plea in the Oath Keepers specific conspiracy so far. He doesn't claim I don't in the documents that I saw doesn't say that he knows the identity of the intermediary, but that Stewart called an intermediary and asked to directly speak to Trump was denied. 
left a message begging to begging for Oath Keepers and other militia groups to be called up to fight. Um, and this was well after it was clear that the coup had not gone off as planned. Right. Because right. we talked about this before, because your assumption is because because of where and how they had the QRF stashed that and what the mission looked like it appeared to be on the ground and how they were acting like their movements it really did and and the fact that they were waiting for what may be martial law to be declared um it really looked like they were trying to find or create some sort of chaos i think that's the word you used in the last time we spoke yes some sort of chaos that way they could they could send up the order of martial law it could be sent back down and then they could do the thing that they had planned to do, which was to um, basically shit on our constitution and, and take it to authoritarian rule at that point. I mean, yeah. Keep Trump in power. Right. Um, possibly arrest members of Congress as it becomes clear that there probably was a plan to just abduct Pence into the back of a Trump loyalist secret service vehicle and keep him away from the Capitol while the election was, ruled decertified right and then that didn't go off because pence became incredibly canny at the last moment and refused to bend on the advice of dan quayle so then the second chance the second option is to create um, a giant street ball brawl, brawl riot with the expected antifa counter protesters and mm -hmm. blm counter protesters that everyone thought was going to be there didn't show up create a riot pitting Trump supporters against the Capitol Police and in the chaos of that try to secure members of Congress as prisoners. Right. That way that way the ones that law. would the ones that would vote to to not sir or to to uh, to not certify the election, that would be the majority at that point. Let me read you a quote um from uh, this NPR article from the court hearing where Brian Ulrich actually pled guilty. This is the question that the judge asked in the hearing. Uh, the judge says, did you do that, sir? Agree with Mr. Rhodes and develop a plan to stop the lawful transfer of presidential power by January 20th, 2021. That was the question. Ulrich's reply was, yes, your honor. Um, so uh, an open court is um, admitting that they were developing a plan. Now we're, we're using, we're using the evidence that we have at hand to know what the plan is. I mean, eventually um, if Stuart were to go to trial, this plan will be laid out in front of us and the evidence and the discovery will be. I am laid incredibly out excited that the, uh, it looks like the <laughs> January 6th congressional committee and the department of justice have been working together this entire time. Mm -hmm. What, what, gi scenes. what gives you, what gives you that mm -hmm. sense? What gives you that sense? It's, be that was the recent article that came out. I believe it mm -hmm. was uh, regarding uh, subpoenas for records and subpoenas for testimony for the five members of Congress, right? That are right. that they're trying to call up to be questioned, and it was revealed that this is part of a series of subpoenas. <sighs> Cannot remember the detail from the article. I've had a lot on my mind, and it's been. Mm -hmm. Like stuff, information has just been falling in one eye and out the other, along with uh, all kinds of statistical math that right. I'll never remember again. <laughs> but it was that they also had Department of Justice people right. that were involved with the interview process that had been filing their own series of subpoenas for something that overlapped with what they were specifically doing at the time with subpoenaing these members of Congress, but was not completely the same thing. So that implies another overlapping investigation run by the Department of Justice right. with information sharing. Well, you, you know, those five congressmen, uh, me and Gabe talked about them on the show the other day. They're Kevin McCarthy, uh, Jim Jordan, uh, Andy Biggs, Mo Brooks, and mm -hmm. then what's what's the last one? What's the guy from Pennsylvania? What's Scott Perry? Box? Yeah, Scott Perry, that shit box. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's he's another one that is in the subpoena. But um, we've actually had um, Karen Agnipolo and Michael Popak on from Legal AF, and Karen, I think, has specifically told me and Gabe because a lot of people think that the January 6th Select Committee has to give a referral for crimes. 
and they don't like the Department of Justice doesn't need the select committee to give them a referral like they can be running these investigations and finding the same evidence at the same time. And the January 6th select committee can actually be giving the evidence to the Department of Justice. Mm -hmm. Like it, it doesn't have to be this official thing, which we see with the contempt charge um, where they're trying to hold them in contempt of Congress, which is an official uh, congressional thing that they have to do to do a referral because they have to state, hey, you're in contempt. Now we're referring it to the Department of Justice, right? So this, because the crimes that are committed on January 6th are outside of the January 6th Select Committee and their contempt uh, jurisdiction. So people are kind of getting those things like meshed up in a ball. And I think you're yeah, right. There's what they're seeing and what they're assuming is that the Department of Justice will do nothing. And they're assuming that the committee is a big congressional show that will result in a strongly worded memo. And right. I don't think that's what's happening right. at all. Well, you know, we're at, we're actually me and Gabe are going to stream the uh, the public hearings and we're going to try to leave live stream them from front to back um, to try to give some commentary and let the public see it uh, as best we can. Um, and, and hopefully a lot of people tune in to watch that, not just for our sake, but to actually see what the story is for January 6th. Because I think that's the confusing part about the story of January 6th. And, and the, it always seems to go back to this one focal point other than Trump. But the one focal point that it always points back to is Stuart Rhodes. Like every single time, like Enrique Tario, last time we talked, uh, mm -hmm. the, the Proud Boys leader at the time, he was uh, he was hauled out of his house. He was indicted. Uh, we, we know we talked about him and Stuart meeting the day before January 5th in a parking garage. Um, we talked about the Proud Boys and how Oath Keepers and Proud Boys never get along. And then you find out, then we find out here in the last couple of weeks that Joshua James and this Ulrich were all in communication and all with Roger Stone, who is supposed to have security from the Proud Boys because a political... And then it was switched at the last second. Right. Kelly Meigs. Mm -hmm. Kelly Meigs, um, one of the Oath Keepers from Florida, Kelly Meigs, actually discusses plans to provide security for figures like Roger Stone, Alex Jones, uh, Ali Alexander, Mike Flynn. And some of these people actually didn't take the security, but Roger Stone did because we see evidence of Joshua James right next to Roger Stone um, during the January 6th, uh, the happenings of January 6th. So th this is very the, interesting. The insurrection. Right, right. It, yeah. It's very, it's very, very uh, telling that all this stuff kind of leads back to to Stewart. Like he's kind of this central focal point. Mm -hmm. And there's always it always sticks out in my mind, Dakota, when we talk to you. And I talked about this during Marjorie Taylor Green's hearings because she was asked, did you ever advocate for martial law? Not the store marshals, but like the <laughs> like martial arts, like martial law, how it's actually spelled. But she was asked about martial law. I actually went on a tangent during those hearings, during a break, where I always come back to what you say about the QRF and why it was there. Like, why why in the world would you need a stash of weapons in a spot where you would need it at hand at a quick notice if an order would come down for anything, anything other than martial law? Like, what else is there a reason to have that across there if they were just there to have aid, to make sure sec security, to protect whoever. Like, why would you need a stash of weapons across the Potomac? Why? And it always sticks out in my mind like that. Only if they were going to be forgiven after yep. the fact or right. or effectively deputized is a way to phrase to it all up officially right. beforehand yeah. as Trump's personal paramilitary. And I think why we keep seeing Stuart crop up and also why my family didn't hear from him for months on end is he no longer needed the narcissistic supply of uh, being in contact with his family to even play at being a dad because he was soaking in the supply of being in the middle of this historic event associated with Tr Donald mm -hmm. Trump and his inner circle. And the reason why you see him all over the place so often in all of these events and all these people talking about it or uh, very pointedly not talking about it in the case of MTG who uh, 
can't remember anyone she has ever talked to, any place she's ever been, or what day it was over the course of her entire life, according to her testimony on the stand. It's because Stuart has not only acted out of fear and short-term personal gain in the donations that being pro-Trump could give a flagging organization, but has seen an opportunity to insert himself as Trump's go-to guy for paramilitary action. His general, in other words, like this general fantasy, maybe. like, you know, his, like uh, act, his uh His honorary general or chief of real American internal security incorporated or whatever the fuck it was going to be, where it was going to be his personal brown shirt essay division for whatever he needed Mm -hmm. Because the Proud Boys are street brawlers. Oath Keepers, if you want a right-wing militia to back you up in the middle of a gunfight, I would have called the real guys in Oath Keepers before I would have called the Proud Boys. Proud right. Boys have their place in their niche role. Mm -hmm. Stuart commanding Oath Keepers could have functioned excellently for whatever role they needed an armed paramilitary to fulfill without using federal police or the military. And so I, that is a position I think Stewart was intentionally trying to weasel his way into for trying to get the highest position he could in the post-coup Donald Trump forever world. Wow, so so the MAGA king thing is real. <laughs> I think so. I think that was in Trump's mind the whole time. Trump oh, yeah, see all positions of authority as basically futile. He thinks that being the president, everyone should have ride or die personal loyalty to him because he's a narcissistic sociopath. And he, uh, like, once he got adjusted to having presidential power, it's inconceivable of him to let it go. Right, right. I mean, January 6th was, I mean, like, obviously, you, we, have, we have seen signs of this throughout the presidency. But January 6th, when you're sitting in, in your Oval Office for three to four hours not doing anything, you know, in terms of actually stopping it, you know, then you see a video where he's like, I love you all, because in his mind, he's like, I, I, I truly love you all. You are now literally storming this building because you want to keep me as president because you are still delusional. Yeah, he thought they looked too trashy. He would have liked uh, better dressed, yuppier <laughs> rioters. Because he didn't oh, my God. Some scary boat shoes and some, mm -hmm. you know, button up shirts, maybe, you know, he wanted but, uh, he wanted all the dudes who almost get murdered over business cards from American Psycho. Oh, he just wanted a bunch he of bros, really. He wanted all of Patrick Bates' co-workers to mm. show up in a riot for him because it would <laughs> yeah. have looked higher class on TV. Well, you well yeah, you, I mean, a high-class coup yeah. is, is something that uh, yeah, it's, an authoritarian it, desires. Yeah. Well, different. I mean, a high-class coup has a different different taste in your mouth than just like a regular old coup, you know? Right. He's like, yeah, well, well, the last time, The last time we had one of those, they uh, all almost got... They all almost got killed by Spendley Butler. It happens that way. So there's two there's two parts of this story that haven't happened yet, though. That I want to that that I want to get your take on. And you alluded to one earlier, but there's two things. Number one, uh, you you mentioned the fact that uh, Stewart was terrified to go to D.C. That the militia. He thought it was right really stupid to take, especially an armed Second Amendment protest mm -hmm. or an armed force into D.C. because. Mm -hmm. It would be seen as an aggressive act. If you start a fight right. with the police, you lose, especially if they corner you in on the bridge that the fish guy, whose name I can't quite recall, was planning to march across. So you're going to lose. You're going to look like the aggressor. You're going to lose public opinion at the beginning of a civil conflict that you just instigated. You thought it was moronic. And not, not only that, you're saying that he thought that it could be the end of kind of right wing militias in the country and the movement. So do yep. you think do you think the prosecution if, if and that's my other question is, do you think Stuart Rhodes takes this to the bank? If he goes all the way to the end here, he goes through the entire trial. Or does he plead guilty? That's my next question. But the first off. Do you really do you, do you think that this the insurrection, the violent insurrection where they're trying to overthrow the Constitution and make Donald Trump the MAGA king? Do you think that um, is going to absolutely 
permanently damage not just the Oath Keepers, but all um, the militia groups out there because you are raised in this culture and you know these you know these people you know them front back sideways and you know how they act you know how these organizations uh, interact with culture so tell us do you think that this is going to damage them permanently or do absolutely you think- i think so i think there are a ton of people who would absolutely not be down with a right-wing dictatorship and what Stuart was basically going to accept in the bargain for saving his own skin and weaseling his way into a favored position with dictator Trump is they don't really, most of these guys, specifically, I won't say most of these guys, what you would get continuing to support that are the people who are willing to support a right-wing takeover, a right-wing like totalitarian, ah, can't talk totalitarian takeover in general Mm -hmm. are the hangers on and the bottom of the barrel scrapings. The people that would be the most dangerous opponents in a civil war, I don't believe are down for King Trump being ruler of the United States with the constitution suspended. Right. Especially now that the catastrophic fuck up, of leaking the supreme the current supreme court pending decision drawing if this was an attempt to distract everyone from the january 6 uh hearings and the trials that are upcoming it was badly mistimed it's like i said on twitter it's like a magician's flourish with fucked up timing that just draws the eye to the switch of the cards instead of distracting from it. Right. Or like the smoke bomb. And then you see them leave the stage as opposed to. (laughs) Yeah. Just badly. You mean like the smoke doesn't dissipate enough and it's just like a little puff of smoke. Yeah. And then walk off (laughs) or you just jumped the gun and you walked out ahead of the column of smoke that was going to conceal your path to the concealed back door. Right. It's a horribly mistimed attempt to distract and now that everyone is paying attention it's going to completely wreck the credibility of the right-wing militia movement of oath keepers of trumpism of all of it with everyone who doesn't want uh maybe theocratic Mm -hmm. christian or maybe just right-wing in general uh dictatorship with a strong man who is promising to fix everything. And that means you're going to get, not to say that the remaining crowd isn't incredibly dangerous. The remaining crowd who does want that, there's a lot of them, they are incredibly dangerous. Right, right. But the people who would be the most dangerous are going to bleed out of the movement and the GOP if they continue on this path. In fact, I think they lost a lot of people. I think the GOP was already, I think the Republicans were already on the road to losing a ton more voters than they expected Mm -hmm. in the coming midterms and getting hurt badly by their continued association with Trump. And now they've doubled down on it. I think, think, yeah, I think there's, there's a, there's a few things that you brought up over the last few minutes that I think are really interesting. One Whoever leaked it, maybe Jenny Thomas, don't know. And in terms, <laughs> and uh, he's, not say, he's not saying, but yeah, I'm not saying. saying it's Jenny Thomas. I'm just like, if there was someone that had <laughs> some sort of uh, reason to <laughs> to leak, to distract, you know, to distract, yeah, Roe v. It? Wade would be like, hey, listen, I was involved. Uh, let's forget about January 6th. Obviously, like you said, the time is totally off. Whoever that might be, maybe Jenny Thomas, maybe not. Uh, I think that is a very interesting point. And I think that, you know, with the upcoming January uh, 6th, uh, hearings on June 9th and for the next eight eight days or so, whatever, throughout the, the month of June, I think is only just ramping those efforts up because we're looking at a total breakdown of this country, right? To say like, we're you know, these people want a complete control over women's bodies. They want complete control over uh, the government or decisions when it doesn't go their way. Like people are beginning to actually see like, oh, there's there's actually this crazy ass plan that they have, whether well constructed or not. But then you have the people you brought up, which are like the ones who are the most dangerous are the ones who are going to deflect. Right. And the way that I see it in my mind are they look at this whole situation as a means to an end. And I agree with you. I completely agree that those people are the most dangerous because they have ulterior 
motives in mind. And the third thing I think is that most hilarious, of course, with the Republican Party is just <laughs> the complete hypocrisy and projection, which is I don't want a police state. I don't want a tyrannical government. I don't want anyone who's totalitarian. And then, of course, on the flip side, they're like, I want to control your body. I want to overturn the election. And I want to say whatever you say is the wrong thing. And I'm always right. So I, I want think to there's, control yeah. or eliminate public education. I want exactly. to get rid of gay marriage, interracial marriage, right. ban condoms, ban contraceptives that are not for married couples. Right. I want checkpoints for women, starting with women, crossing mm -hmm. state lines. I want the laws of my state to apply in other states. That is a really nice callback to the uh, Fugitive Slave Acts. That was one of the main causes of the Civil War. Is There is definitely... And it's also shown that the Republican Party has been completely hijacked by this relative minority in the country who desperately want these things. And just yeah. by agitating nonstop and trying to work their way into positions of power, they now control the agenda of the entire GOP. And the old guard have to go along with it to preserve their positions mm -hmm. and preserve their careers. And it's actually a really neat looking roadmap for a hostile takeover of the Democratic Party for anyone who is sick of the traditional old guard Democratic Party acting like a helpless minority, no matter what the actual situation is. It's just if you organize with your friends and you don't stop trying to seize power over the course of years and keep showing up to all of the elections that aren't big and glamorous and shiny, you can seize control. Shh, don't, don't say that out loud. What are you doing? You're, <laughs> you're giving away the game. No, I, I'm, let, let me, let me tell you, hey, cause you, you two have made some great points. And I think, I think it's worth considering um, some of the things that possibly with this leak of the Supreme court um, overturning Roe v. Wade, Number one, it goes back to the Constitution because these people are they absolutely love what is talking. The, what is the Constitution? It. Yeah. Well, they love talking about it. They never love actually what it is or what it stands for, which, right. again, on this show, we say the freedom to oppress the rights of other people is not liberty because liberty is what we really strive for in this country. The rights and the freedoms are just the thing that delivers you the actual liberty. And I actually, you know, thinking about it, listening to you guys talk if we look at the the January 6th public hearings that are going to happen throughout June, we've heard that there's going to be eight of them. It seems like that the Supreme Court decision might have come down during those hearings, which maybe, maybe the right wing didn't want that to get lost in their movement because a lot of them at first were like, yay, we mm -hmm. did it. And, and they all of a sudden realized that they had awakened this sleeping giant, right? Like they had realized, Oh, maybe this isn't such a great thing. And they were like, leak, 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 who leaked it. Right. Like that was their right, first right, inclination right. was to pat themselves on the back. And almost immediately they realized that they had, they had totally changed the conversation to this, that actually the constitution is something that is really important in this country and what is happening is the January 6 hearings, the public hearings, are going to focus on these people were trying to overturn the document that protects your rights and possibly the right to your bodily autonomy. Like how important this is. Like these people who are trying to functionally take away your rights through functional government by uh, appointing Supreme Court justices that seem to be bought and paid for to get to win elections in congressional districts and and the state legislators and these governorships to erode away at your constitutional rights wherever and whenever they can. These are the people who wanted to actually overthrow the Constitution and it's violently seize power, right. suspend constitutional protections, place the country under martial law, mm -hmm. under their control. Right. And it's also going to be enticing because it's going to raise the prospect of the people responsible for packing the Supreme Court with fucking lunatics the way that it is now facing consequences for their many other illegal actions. Right. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are going to be paying attention that were not paying attention previously. And I think any attempt to deflect 
attention because now the narrative is they're trying to equate the protesters outside of the justices' homes right, right. with the January 6th insurrection. I'm hearing this repeated by people who genuinely think that uh, January 6th was just a bunch of old people wandering into the Capitol after the cops invited yeah. them in. As I don't see a bunch of protesters at the Supreme Court Justice House that are smearing shit on their walls or sp uh, spraying breaking bear in. mace. Yeah, yeah break, or break, getting yeah. into shield wall shoving matches with riot cops and spraying. Right. Like this is not apples to apples. Faces. This is a huge right. difference no. in comparison. You and know, the only people that are going to buy into that are so ideologically suckered in. Right that they were going to be showing up for the GOP no matter what anyway. Yeah. You know, so, uh, um, no, that's okay. Because you brought up um, protesting outside justice zones, but we've seen, you know, the hilarity of some of this is that Susan Collins called the cops. I want to show you a video, Dakota. Maybe you can react to it. Um, this is apparently, a and I don't know where Gabe found this video. He must have found it somewhere on the deep dark I web. found it on Reddit right. somewhere. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure. I'm that, sure. That is the deep web. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, so, but I want to show you this video. It, it is hilarious um, because it seems to show the police officers that showed up when Susan Collins called because there was this sinister sidewalk chalk. Let's let's watch. Detective, I just got Senator Collins standing about the sidewalk chalk. She's very concerned and Shh. he's working. Who? Detective Johnson with CSI. Who called crime scene? It's just chalk on a sidewalk. No chalk scene investigation well i'm glad i arrived when i did thank you sorry is this a joke no but i'll tell you what is a joke whoever decided to dust my chalk scene for prints i was following protocol and i bet you also thought it was a smart idea to outline a sidewalk note in chalk yeah so jesus you might as well just piss all over my evidence detective you're gonna want to see this coming oh and uh while i'm gone try not to ruin any more of my chalk scene is this guy serious? As serious as they come. He was assigned to the Hopscotch Massacre of 2015. What? He organized a statewide manhunt for the sidewalk chalker. Worked on it 24-7. But then the case went cold, and now he blames himself for not solving it. Even ruined his marriage. Well, I've never heard, heard of this case. Or they're trying to make it look it's funny that he's eating well, chalk. chalk seems to have I used to do that all the time as a kid. I don't see it as unusual. Carbonate. Mountain Dew Code Red. Shit, he's back. Who? The sidewalk chalker. Oh my god, it was just a harmless chalk message supporting women's reproductive rights. You may think it's harmless, but politics is where I draw the line. Chalk scene investigation, Gabe. I don't know where the hell you found this video. I don't know. I I'm that. amazed that there are people that use TikTok that are old enough to remember CSI Miami. That's, Get, that's I'm one of them. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think it's hilarious, but, but to your point though, that, that this this authoritarian rule it does get clownish right like they clown so much that the establishment even susan collins herself clowns herself by trying to you know trip over her clown shoes right. to try to seem like oh you know to sycophant to these people i'm even the though, victim i was the right, victim here exactly, they were trying exactly. to attack me and it's like exactly. susan Somebody wrote chalk on the public sidewalk. Right. Like, what are you, that what are you kind of shit is why it is so important to show up for primary elections. Right. Mm -hmm. Not just the protests, but the elections as Not well. Not just right. the protests. Yeah. Right. Because if voting was worthless, and this is something I see now that I'm on Twitter and I can be angry 24 7. Uh, <laughs> Which is, is the real Twitter? purpose of Twitter. Right. Is real that what Twitter Twitter? Twitter. Right. Yeah, that's what Elon, Elon Musk didn't yeah. understand. Right. Fuck yeah, yeah. Elon um, Musk's freedom of speech. It's about being angry. Not it's about angry. being angry. It's about being angry nonstop and new, being angry in new ways. But right. um, I see all these people going, oh, we've, what do you mean vote harder? We already voted. It's like, no, you fuckers turned out for one presidential election mm -hmm. right. in a last ditch effort to plug the biggest hole at the bottom of the sinking ship and it bought us a little bit of time right but right. we're still pale in the water yeah, out of the, the ship the one, like, we like are that, yeah. still on a semi-wrecked schooner in the middle of a hurricane <laughs> everything's broken we're taking on water the people that are supposed to be helping us bail out bail it out are actively breaking the pumps and yeah. stabbing the bottoms like, oops, of their buckets. Did, did we need that? My bad. You know, <laughs> right. like 
Oh my god! Yeah, I love I love shit. your description of it, Dakota. I love your description. Yeah, half the people on the Titanic with you have private life vests that they're pretty sure will work, and they all took out insurance policies on the boat. Right, <laughs> right, right. So right. what is happening now is the consequence of all these people that are like, "Well, we did vote," not understanding that to get us to this point, the Republicans, like the hardcore. My party is my sports team, tribe, family, and religion conservatives who would cheer for a dictatorship. Those mm -hmm. ones have been showing up for every single election, right. midterm, school board, town yeah. council, state rep, congressional, presidential for 40 goddamn years. Right. They, they elect dog. Point. They elect fascist dog catchers. They're like right. that guy. Well, I mean, that you guy. look at their group and they are, you know, again, just really good at well, bullshit messaging, but they're really good at nailing it home to induce fear in yourself to be like, well, I don't want it to become a socialist bankrupt nation like i want it to be american and i want to be freedom you know free and all this stuff but at the end of the day it's like that's as democrats or as liberals or whoever you are that's on the left side of this on the aisle or spectrum you know anyone you who doesn't want a dictatorship at this right. point yeah exactly anyone who doesn't that is a very good that, that is a very good uh line in the sand to draw if you do <laughs> not want a dictatorship you know this is where you stand if you do then obviously you're the the pro putin pro insurrection uh, MAGA Trump King bullshit, right? But you look at the people who always go to the polls, who always vote, right? There is that fear. That, there is that emotion that is driving them to say, I don't want this thing that my local councilman or senator or whoever is 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 repeating over and over that it's going to become this, this crazy uh, socialist state or whatever it is. Biden's going to steal all your baby formula. Exactly. Exactly. That's a, that's another example. But, but you we shouldn't at, get babies formula, by the way. We shouldn't right. give them formula. Yeah, no... Once they're born, it's, no it's formula. Always, it's always both sides of the fence with these motherfuckers. L l listen, you can't, you got to pick a lane, and they won't. Well, they try to drive between the lane, and then you're like, you're dangerous, and you're causing damage to everyone around you. And that's what they're like. No, 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 no it's free. I well, it's if want. you never pick a lane, then you're always right in retrospect, as well, long yeah, as you're true. using yeah, an yeah. edited, a fucking edited video compilation. That's, that's right. That's point. what that's what right. Trump has always done, and they and it's it's an easy way to draw drive wedges, right? Yeah. And that's what that's what the because you guys described is the left uh, and 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 dakota said it right if you're just against a dictatorship because we've seen a lot of people even in the public sphere that have been pro-life for a long time struggle with this leak and struggle with this decision for scotus because mm -hmm. they're pro-life and they don't want roe v wade but they know what it means when this decision happens right. that it was an authoritarian type rule put this on the people of the United States, no matter mm -hmm. how much they're against abortion it's or why or whatever. the way that the GOP immediately seized That's on right. it to 100% right. telegraph what they actually plan to do, which I think right. is the real mistake, is instead of letting it remain Roe v. Wade, they immediately jumped on we're going to get rid of interracial marriage, we're going to get right. rid of gay marriage, we're going to reverse shit all the way back through Browning v. Board of Education, mm -hmm. back to the decisions about whether the United States can force you to not teach your children your native language as a first language. They're going to roll it all back. The state governments are going to fucking ban condoms and contraceptives and start instituting checkpoints that demand medical tests of you. And they made it so obvious at the front that repealing Roe v. Wade or overturning it is only the first step in their wider program that people that are single issue on Roe v. Wade are being confronted with this massive wall of consequences behind it that they would not be if there were GOP, like the MAGA captured fundamentalist GOP had exercised a little bit of patience. People might have let that slip under the radar, but they've become so overconfident as right, a result of four years of Daddy Trump that they can't right, do that's that. That's part anymore. of their brand. That's part of their brand is to always overstep, to always over negotiate, to always mm -hmm. overbid. You know, um, not to toot my own owner or pat myself on the back, but you brought up banning condoms. 
Um, I was one of the first ones that said, as this decision came down, like this is, they're going to start you white dudes out there. You trumped up white dudes that go into a gas station two years from now. And you want to get your condoms. Cause you want to get your fuck on. And, and the, the store clerks are like, we don't have condoms anymore. What are you doing? They're like, what do you mean you don't have condoms? Like, they're illegal. Like, what the fuck are you talking? These people don't understand. They really don't understand what they're cheering on. They have no fucking clue. Right. They have no clue what they're cheering on. I also said that Elon Musk won't ever own Twitter, and I think I'm going to be right. Uh, so I don't, I don't I'm going to pat myself on the back. Yeah. But, I, I, was, I, 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 we're going to have yeah. no – if we let these idiots rule, we'll have no condoms – but right. Elon Musk also never owned Twitter. Uh, the last question, the last point I want to ask you about uh, before we go is Stuart Rhodes taking this thing all the way to the end zone. I think he will. I think okay. he will unless he gets a you, very yeah. favorable plea deal and it looks like he is dead certain to lose because he remembers um, – people from Bundy Ranch who skated it when they went to trial. So describe that. Describe that. Describe that. Describe that. But it's why, because why believe that. It's because, uh, like, for example, Eamon Bundy personally mm -hmm. did not go to prison until after Malhewer. And then he was let off from that because there were so many federal informants inside his inner circle at Malhewer that it created maybe not reasonable doubt, but reason to doubt that there was he did this of his own free will and cognition. Or and created a shadow of a doubt that it was entrapment, and he saw that several times. People who did not take the plea bargain had right. a shot. So you're at saying walking. his competence comes from those past experiences with these paramilitia uh, type convictions and type escaping consequences right. when they mm -hmm. went to trial because of a specter of federal informants. And entrapment, which I is something a lesson federal agencies are going to have to learn, is that the shit that they do when they are entrapping uh, Muslim men into bomb plots that are ninety nine percent federal agent, right, will not work in a court of law prosecuting a Christian white guy. It's just a simple fact. Is right. the precedent set in nabbing? Muslim men that are vulnerable to radicalization and uh, far left groups and environmental groups and eco terrorists. Like to what you're saying, like while we've been on this call or while we've been on this chat right now, there was a mass shooting where 10 people were killed by an extremist manifesto leaked online. Like th while we've been talking, this whole thing has no happened. Shit. Jesus Christ. And, but it is an example of, you know, a Christian white guy escorted in cuffs to the, to the police car, nothing, you know, no kind of situation. Did they buy him Burger King this time? I mean, or was it? Windy? I think they. I think they got him a a, a Happy Meal. Starbucks. If I had to recall. Maybe they bought him. Uh, I mean, you know. Well, what 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 was the one cop he said uh, about? Uh, he was yeah. He he was disgruntled. He was he was discouraged. Oh, he was he, he was jerked hungry. off he was too much or some shit. Like right. come on, give me a fucking break. And the thing this is, this is this, it, this, this person also is a self described white supremacist and anti semite, and of course. Totally he fine. went on his shooting spree. Yes, it was in a supermarket. He went on his shooting spree in Buffalo, New York, in a grocery store in a predominantly black area, so that yep. he could kill black people. Yeah, and I mean, he yeah, it's... threw a bunch of he threw a bunch of dog whistles into his manifesto, which I would not recommend you read because it's kind of worthless. Just to the it, they were all things that he saw from previous white supremacist manifestos. I think that he saw got media attention. Yeah. So, oh, I so think you think he's kind not... of like a like a copycat, copycat, copycat. He's a copycat. Kind of he is a gestalt copycat of everyone under the sun who was a white supremacist mass shooter, including Dylan Roof, and mm -hmm. just cribbed shit from all their manifestos and jammed it together. It's bordering on a plagiarized manifesto. So, so he basically wants his name. He's a white yeah. supremacist. He wants his name out there as... Right. Well, yeah, the sad because, thing is that's what we do in this country. We make yeah, we, people uh, who are the the uh, perpetrators, the, the We the signal predators. boost the perpetrators of mass shootings, and then we yeah. wonder why we have a problem. Exactly. When was the last time there was a school or a mall shooting in Switzerland or Finland where there are the only like two of the only places in the world where there are as many semi-automatic rifles floating around at random as there are in the united states it doesn't happen because we have a cultural problem yeah right well i've said, I've said that before i've said and and really 
um, you know, to your point there, and, and I grew up in white America, I grew up in rural white America, it is, and, and you know, a lot of people might knock me for this, but it is a white culture problem. It is a white gun culture problem where white males think that they own everything. They cannot be punished. I mean, we see it inside media, even like, like even Joe Rogan on his show, he's always talking about how I get to get it. You got, you used to get to what do anything you wanted. Like that's not freedom. You don't get to do whatever you want. That's not fucking true. You've never been able to just drive down the road at 500 miles an hour. You've never been able to just speed through a stop sign. Only if you weren't get caught. You can't just punch someone in the mouth because you don't like them at the grocery store. Like, you can't do whatever you want. That is all bullshit. Just because you think you have the entitlement and the privilege to do whatever you want doesn't actually mean you do. But maybe you're alluding to the fact that maybe they do do. And, um... You're saying that Stewart's mindset of his trial, maybe that he does have that privilege. He does have Absolutely. the right to do whatever he wants. And it's that white gun culture type mentality, this, this I mean, entitlement, white entitlement. The history of gun control and the massacre of fringe groups. Nobody gave a fuck about the move bombing. People who live, I, I, about to make myself sound ignorant if it's not Philadelphia. That was Philadelphia, right? I, You know, you got me. Um, it was a uh, fringe black group that took up residence inside an apartment building and refused to leave and hold up in there. There was a standoff. The police ended the standoff by dropping dynamite from a fucking police helicopter and burned down two city blocks. Nobody who people grow up in the city of Philadelphia and never know that it happened. Yeah, I don't and, I did, I'd never heard of this either. And the probably the reason why is because of. Who they it was perpetrated murdered. against black people. Yes, right, exactly. People, the uh, gun laws, the beginning of the trend in gun laws that eventually led to uh, the ATF and the FBI killing Randy Weaver's family started with Reagan coming down on the Black Panthers. Exactly. Right. Yep. The he was like, no, 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 don't, don't bring those gun guns to the building here. In no, the like... country. The worst, most egregious gun laws in the whole country that everyone loves to lay at the feet of liberal Democrats, the reason they are the way that they are, the reason why they are structured in a way that is so intentionally confusing, changeable, and meant to create, obviously, as many felons who cannot vote as possible, is because the original template was to fuck with black people right. by the hand of Ronald Reagan. So you have these things where... Law enforcement, people inside law enforcement get away with a thing. They get away with, the Philadelphia police get away with bombing an apartment building and burning down two city blocks and killing a bunch of people. They get away with gun confiscation to fuck up the Black Panther movement. They get away with that shit. And then somebody inside the feds tries to use this against white extremists and it all goes to hell and creates an enormous cultural firestorm. And it's because I think federal law enforcement forgets about white privilege because they have mm -hmm. a blind spot for institutional privilege because in all honesty, I'd say federal police agencies are in no way immune to being affected by it. So they don't want to acknowledge that it's real. So they fall prey to it, even in trying to prosecute cases. And that's where you get people walking away after the Malheur standoff because of a level of informant involvement that would not have even been considered noteworthy if they were Muslim extremists and carried out the exact same actions. And that, so in a way, these, this effect of white militia dudes getting away with shit that they should not have been able to given the precedent of what charges stick to non-white or Muslim people has created the confidence that Stuart Rhodes has, that he will be able to go all the way through trial, turn it into a circus, get his name all over the media, and then walk away with his image rejuvenated with the right wing. Well, I, I think I think Stewart is uh, completely dead wrong about that, and I think oh, uh, he's completely fucked. Yes. Right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I I think I think he's capital F U C K fucked, fucked, fucked because yeah. he's not he's not just fucked um in in the legal trial, 
But when we see what we're going to see on January 6th, because I would suspect that the words Oath Keepers and Stuart Rhodes' name comes up uh, several times in the public hearings, and it's not going to be good for Stuart, and it's not going to be good for anyone who's associated um, with those public hearings. Dakota, thank you for joining us again. Please come back as these uh, January 6th select uh, committee hearings develop as the news with these Oath Keepers, if we get more plea deals from these Oath Keepers, um, you know, we, we always appreciate your insight, not just into the news, but also into the mind and the culture of the militia and what it means, what it means for our, our country. Like what, what, what is it going to be? If, are we going to be authoritarian? Are we not? So I appreciate you joining us. Thank you. Everyone stick around. We will be right back after these messages. Buy the products. Yeah. <laughs> 